Would you rather live under anarchy or tyranny? Next, we'll talk to a man who's experienced both, and we'll find out which one he prefers. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Our guest today is Ambassador John Limbert, who is a distinguished professor at the U.S. Naval Academy and a former Foreign Service Officer for the United States. Welcome, Ambassador Limbert. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for joining us. You have had an incredibly illustrious career uh, with the U.S. Foreign Service, going back to some of the most dramatic moments in U.S. history including the Iran hostage crisis. Why don't we start with that and uh, tell us a little bit about what was happening in your experience in the late 1970s and maybe flash forward to uh, what's happening in U.S.-Iran relations today. Well, it's been 30, it's been, uh, it's been 30 years now. That's true. I was, I was in the Foreign Service for about 33, uh, 33 years. Um, had, a wonderful, had a wonderful career. Um, it wasn't, uh, it, but it certainly was not all uh, cocktail parties and rece cocktail parties and receptions. And in late seven, in uh, late seventy nine, summer of seventy nine, late seventy nine, I found my I was in the em serving in the embassy in Tehran. Uh, my connections to Iran, actually personal connections and um, academic connections, go back uh, even farther than that. They go back almost fifty, almost uh, fifty years now. Um, but it, it was the period following the fall of the Sh following the fall of the Shah, which had uh, was it brought a tremendous shock to uh, to the world, to the whole world, but particularly to the U.S. government, where this uh, someone who had been an ally and a country that had been very stable um, and very peaceful and on the road to development was uh, was now uh, in chaos. And we didn't know where it was going. Where it was going it was very uncertain. It was very violent. Things were very difficult. And we were there, doing our best to um, reestablish some kind of relationship uh, in the context, really, of a of still going on. And maybe some of the view most many viewers won't remember this, but this was the time of the Cold War, mm -hmm. and the. Uh, priority of our policies then were based on the Cold, were based on the Cold War, and one of them was to keep Soviet influence out of the Middle East in general and out of Iran in, partic uh, uh, in particular. So even though the government that was coming in was so far removed from the government that it displaced, you thought that after a period of time there would be some continuity and the relationship might continue. I think the idea was to, to, to coin a phrase, if, if life had handed us lem a lemon, now we had to make lemonade mm -hmm. uh, in some way. And although the situa the, clearly there was a drastic change um, inside, of, uh, inside of Iran, uh, larger necessities uh, forced us to, one, to be there, uh, and two, to establish some kind of re some kind of relationship with whatever the new whatever the new reality was. When did you and the others at the embassy realize you were f physically in danger? Uh, that that's a hard question to answer. We we knew the situation was not good, and that whatever whoever was had nominal authority had actually very little authority over what was, go what was going on. But what was strange, John, was that you had a city of Tehran, seven, eight million people at the time with essentially no police force. The police had disappeared, but it was a fairly safe place. I mean, unlike what happened to Iraq, say, in, in, in Iraq uh, many years later, many years later, um, Tehran was very different. I mean, I, I and friends, we would travel out, we'd go out to, we could go out visiting, uh, quite sa quite safely, so there there it hadn't broken down into that kind of anarchy uh, uh, anarchy yet. Um, what obviously what set what set it off uh, one was the um, the political conflicts that were going on inside the country, and two was uh, President Carter's decision 
uh, in October of 1979 to admit the Shah. So then everything literally exploded. And uh, then everything fell apart. Uh, uh, then every, I mean, it was precarious. It was precarious enough uh, to start, but uh, that uh, that step, and which people still debate, still still debate, uh, really was the death blow to any chance of a normal relationship. Thirty years later, we still don't have one, um, and certainly the death blow to the established to a, to the U.S. mission. Well, tell us what happened to you personally what, when, when the worst developed. What, what were you doing and how did you respond? Um, well, I was in the embassy Saturday, that, that morning. I think it was a Sunday, mor uh, Sunday morning, 4th of November, 1970, 1979. And we were, uh, uh, our compound was overrun uh, by six or 700 very unhappy young people. But remember, this was the 70s. Uh, the tail end of the 70s. So this was the, still the era of the, the student sit-in. Um, and that's what we thought we were dealing with. That's what the students themselves, that's what the Iranians themselves said they thought they were doing. Uh, come in, occupy something, make a statement, make a brave statement, issue a 20-point communique, um, and march out. Um, and what began as this sort of 70s-style sit-in turned into a huge international incident, uh, which still casts its shadow today, and of course, which also cost, uh, uh, cost uh, Jimmy Carter's presidency. So then, of course, we all know that after a very long period of time, and you can tell us precisely the number of days, you did emerge from this horrible situation. And, um, and then what? H how did the, the, the world look to you at that point? Were you filled with, uh, with hope since you were freed from captivity, or were you still very much concerned about the course of events in the region? We were there 14 months, or some 444 days, but who was, count who was counting, of course? Um, well, of course, Nightline was, count uh, uh, Nightline was counting, and our, clearly our, we and our families were counting. Uh, most of us, as we came out, there were 52 of us who came out. Uh, 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 came out. Those of us who were in the for some military, some foreign, ser some uh, foreign service, uh, those of us are in the foreign service. If I'm not mistaken, all but one stayed in the foreign service and continued in the, in, the, in that career. For uh, for me, it if it did anything, I suppose it reinforced my commitment uh, that. In international relations, you need a rule of law. You need procedures. You need to uh, re respect uh, ancient practices and ways of and, and ways of doing things. Because we had seen the al we had seen the alternative close up, and it was a very frightening alternative. And as you said, you and others stayed in diplomatic service, and in your case until, was it the mid I, I retired in 2006. 2006. So and I did come back in 2010, 2009, 2010. I served again, coming out of retirement, for nine months in the, uh, uh, in the Middle East Bureau of State, Depart of State okay. Department. Okay, good. Well, two things then as we move the conversation to what is going on now. How would you assess, first of all, the relationship between the United States and Iran, and and do you think we are able to get past some of the critical obstacles in that relationship? Uh, I would hope, I would have hoped so. I would have hoped we would have done it, when we've done it sooner. When we left Iran that in, uh, back in January of, of 1981, my, my prediction, which like a lot of my predictions about Iran has turned out to be wrong, uh, was that in five years, seven years, tempers would cool, and that we and the Iranians, if not friends, would at least be able to talk to each other about things that mattered to both sides of uh, uh, to both sides, whether they were area issues or um, international terrorism or the situation in Afghanistan or whatever else it was, whatever else it was, um, and again, talk not as friends, but at least on a professional professional level, just as we spoke to the Soviet, we, we never broke off talking to the Soviet Union 
um, over 40, over 30, or over uh, 40 or 50 years through the worst days of the Cold, uh, um, of the Cold War. Uh, that prediction turned out to be wrong, and 30 years later, we're still um, glaring at each other, and this uh, strange, uh, estrangement continues. Do you see any prospect of breaking through on any of those fronts in the near future, or do you think it's going to be tense for the foreseeable future? I'm not optimistic we're going to see a breakthrough soon. The president, President Obama, um, clearly um, had the intention to change, to, to make a change in this relationship. Uh, he talked about that during his uh, primary campaign. He talked about it during the election campaign. He spoke, ab he spoke about it consequent in, in various messages and, 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 and speeches. Uh, but it's proved, uh, it's proved much more difficult, I think, than people, people thought it would. Uh, the habits of 30 years, uh, the distrust that's built up over 30 years, the lack of communication, um, over, thir over 30 years, and something that the president said that uh, reflects maybe his Harvard Law School background, uh, say saying that the Iranians seem to have difficulty getting to yes. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things have, have, have made it hard. So it's hard to see, at least out there in the next six months, a year, some, um, something that would make a, make a basic change uh, in, in, what's, in what's gone on. Now, there were some analysts who thought the Iranian Revolution would spark similar revolts in other parts of the region, and that, that didn't happen in great numbers. But uh, in, in, in recent months, we have seen revolts of, of a different kind break out in many parts of the Middle East and, and North Africa. What, what is your take on what's happening in those situations? Are there any connections going back to 1978-79? Um, I think there are con I think there are connections, but the connections may be less to 78, 79 than to what happened in 2000 uh, uh, in 2009 in Iran following the uh, the, elect the, the, the elections and what many Iranians viewed as a stolen uh, as, a, as a stolen election, and when you had an outpouring of uh, of protest. Uh, and then a reaction of a, of a, a, brutal, uh, of a brutal suppression, uh, but an outpouring that ca clearly caught many, many, uh, caught the Iranian government by surprise, caught many uh, observers uh, by surprise. And so what, what it might be what might more accurate to say is that the, the Arab Spring of 2011 takes, uh, could take much of its inspiration from what happened in Tehran following June of, uh, and Iran following June of 2009, because many things are similar. Uh, you have, in many places, um, a, an elite uh, ruling a country unaccountable, unelected for 30 to 40 years. 30 to, to 30 to 40 years, power remaining in the hands of essentially the same, the, the same group. While this is going on, societies are changing. Uh, the, uh, Iran, is, Iran in, in 2009 was not the same as it was in, two, in 1970, 1979. Rate of education, much higher. Position of women, much different, uh, uh, much different. Same thing in the Arab countries. But while all of these social changes are going, while these social changes are going on, John, you have people sitting in their palaces, uh, cut off, isolated from the reality of their own society, and then they wake up one morning, people are in the streets screaming, death to the dictator. And the rulers look at each other and say, oh, I wonder who they're talking about. Well, they're not talking about Mussolini, and they're not talking about Franco. <laughs> no, that, that, that seems to be one of the disconnects in many of these cases. So where do you see it leading? Do you think that we're going to have changes where you actually change, where we actually remove the top leadership of the governments, uh, and, and then where do you go? That's the hardest thing, uh, uh, thing to know. Um, clearly, some some of the ruling uh, groups out there, and I include, uh, I include Syria, um, I include Iran on this, have decided 
they're not going to give an inch. Um, they're just going to dig in because they've come to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that if they give any concession, that they'll be over they'll be overthrown by this wave demanding change. So they are going to fight it down to the uh, uh, they're going they're going to fight it tooth and nail down to the last ditch uh, to to resist. Um, one would like to see. Uh, a come out of it, obviously, a society that is a, a kind of government that treats its citizens decently, that is accountable, that is uh, that has accountability, that offers some kind of a con that uh, that observes the uh, the the universal human rights of its own citi uh, uh, of its own citizens. Uh, problem is, of course, that the the history of political change uh, in a lot of places, and not only the Middle East. Sometimes things lead that way, sometimes they do not. Mm -hmm. And so we have the example of 1979, uh, 1978 and 1979 in Iran, where there was a tremendous amount of hope at the beginning that the downfall of the Shah would be followed by something better. And it turned out, of course, that it was followed uh, by a very harsh and very brutal and very uh, re repressive operation, and certainly not with a lot of democracy. And is that the perception that most people in Iran today have of, of that regime, that it hasn't worked out as planned and given an option, they'd pick something else? I should say, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I have not, I have not been in Iran now for, 30, uh, for, for over 30 years. This was not by my choice. I would love to go back, but I'm, I don't think I'm very welcome, th uh, welcome there at the moment. But I would love to go there and ask exactly that, uh, exactly that question. Uh, but we are, you have to be very careful. I think we have to be very careful as, as, uh, as political scientists here in making assumptions about what other people think and and for example assumptions that somehow arabs or iranians don't mind being repressed suppressed and don't mind uh, having their right to speak uh, taken away or don't mind being thrown in prison for no reason or don't mind being tortured uh, to me that's that's a that's a fallacy but it's a fallacy perpetrated very often uh, by governments for their own uh, uh, for their own purposes, where do you see this whole Arab Spring going? Um, do you do you see an endpoint, or are we in for a, uh, an extended period of uncertainty? I think what it what is going to happen is that the kind of system that I mentioned, where a system is 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 unaccountable to its own people, where a government is unaccountable to its own people, where a ruling elite uh, essentially enriches itself for 30 or 40 years. That's going to be very difficult to pres uh, uh, very difficult to preserve, and these systems will have to change either from inside, or uh, or under uh, under pressure from the under pressure from the street. Uh, one interesting thing to, uh, uh, that you can note, I mean, make of this what you what you will, is that places that have some in the region that have some form of democracy, maybe not a perfect democracy, but at least some some form of it. Um, and I think of Lebanon, I think of Turkey, maybe Iraq. Though these movements have been less, have, uh, these places have been less affected by these uh, uh, by these movements because these movements, as I said, are. I think are basically going at one evil, and that is this evil of the unaccountable president for life um, e ruling elite that's, that is entrenched itself in its palaces. And, and I guess one question that for us as Americans is always uh, involved is what should the, the U.S. role be? And I guess the U.S. role in the Middle East is part of a much larger question about what the U.S. role should be in, in the world of the 21st century and how we can more effectively uh, engage and, and act uh, diplomatically. 
So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, pe when, especially when there's a, a domestic crisis in a country such as Libya and people are being killed and there seems to be a, a good guy and a bad guy, you get a lot of clamoring for action, yeah. but then the action has to have limits because otherwise you could end up with a situation like you have in Afghanistan and Iraq where you have a commitment of troops on the ground and where does that lead? So, uh, and, and then how do you remain consistent? with your policies when you respond with airstrikes in a place like Libya and something similar happens in a place like Syria and you don't respond, people criticize you for being inconsistent. So how do you deal with all of that and still lead? Because everyone I, I think in the 21st century still expects the United States to be at the forefront of global leadership. My experience at least over, uh, over 33 years in the Foreign Service is that a lot of these issues are, uh, cons are there, you are not going to get consistency. Uh, that the U.S., like, ev like every other country in the world, follows its, national, it follows its national interests, promotes its national interests, and these interests are not uniform and consistent in every, pl uh, um, uh, in, in every place. Um, you have certain uh, basic principles such as upholding of the universe people's universal universal rights um, as recognized but what do you do what what do you actually do in support of those principles in in Syria or Saudi Arabia or Libya or China may vary a great deal given balancing of every uh, um, of every factor because that is not the only factor that it's going to determine uh, determine our foreign policy. Uh, many many have said that maybe the first the principle of um, in foreign policy the first principle is do no harm. Um, and again, I quote something the president said um, when speaking about Libya when speaking about Libya, talking about not sending forces into Libya and specifically pointing to Iraq and as if I recall his word he said uh, we've been down that road in Iraq and we're not going and, and we're not going there again. Well maybe if you could outline for us some general principles how, how can we do that in a constructive way whether it's in North Africa the Middle East or someplace else where we are actually working perhaps hand in hand with governments and movements that are trying to change situations in a constructive way. Is it possible to do that or do we have to, to act well, on a case-by-case -case basis in keeping with the national interest as you said? As, you know, the, the problem, uh, the, the thing about you know leadership is fine but frankly uh, the United States nor can, nor can, the United States cannot nor can anyone else, as far as I know, solve every problem, right every wrong that is in the world. I think there's a, a Russian proverb, you can't cry for everyone in the cemetery. Um, I mean, there are limits to what we can, there are limits to what we can do. Um, part of it, and uh, one thing you can do is more active in, you listen to what the others, to what others say. Listen to what others want, listen to, to um, the concerns of the other side. We talk about coalition building, speak to, our, uh, uh, speak to our allies, work in concert with our allies, know that we can't always go it, uh, go it alone, that our ability to affect world events is not, limit, uh, 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 is not limitless. Uh, a certain amount of caution uh, before, um, uh, perhaps again, this reveals either my age, maybe it's my age or my background, but I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious uh, about political change. Uh, and again, maybe it goes back to my experience, but I will tell you, uh, and maybe, I sh maybe I'm not proud of this, but it's a reality that uh, I've lived under uh, tyranny and I've lived under anarchy. And frankly, I'd prefer the tyranny. Uh, the uh, anarchy. I mean, if you want Somalia, if that's what you want, that's that's one thing. And maybe the maybe the tyranny is preferable 
in the sense of guaranteeing basic in guaranteeing basic secu basic security. So uh, again, that's not may, may not be a popular state may not be a popular statement to all of the listener to, to all the listeners out there. But it is a re uh, it is a reality that. Uh, I think we need to be cautious before identifying good guys and bad guys uh, in, these issue, in these issues. Well, thank you for joining us today, Ambassador Limbert. Thank you, John. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office.